Great. Well, welcome to everybody. Uh, thanks very much for coming along uh, to this seminar. I'll start with a, an acknowledgement of country. So the University of Queensland acknowledges the traditional owners and their custodians of the lands on which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to the country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Okay, if we could just move along a slide. So um, what's the purpose of the AI Plus seminars? So first of all, to promote transdisciplinary AI research and collaboration. So we're trying to get people from across the different disciplines, um, both at UQ and elsewhere. We wanna connect UQ AI researchers and students and engage with impact areas. And primarily the impact area we're looking at today is the clinical area. Great. So the series so far, um, we've had we've had two in the series so far and we've got one more to go, uh, which is today. So today we're fortunate to have a practicing clinician and UQ professor, Ian Scott, join us to provide his valuable insights on AI within healthcare. Ian's a consultant general physician and director of internal medicine and clinical epidemiology at Princess Alexandra Hospital in Brisbane and professor of medicine at University of Queensland. He chairs the Metro South Clinical AI Working Group and the Queensland Health Sepsis AI Working Group, has co-authored several papers on the use of AI in healthcare and is actively developing and evaluating AI applications in diagnosis and therapeutics. He has a long-standing research interest in clinical informatics, evidence-based medicine, clinical reasoning and quality and safety improvement and is a member of the Royal Australasian College of Physicians Digital Health Advisory Committee. Ian is a recipient of several NHMRC and government research grants. He's over 227 publications and 6,700 citations for his work, including thought-provoking pieces around patient safety, such as uh, the 2017 MJA article revealing around 21,000 cases of misdiagnosis made in clinical settings as just one of them. Today, I'd like to welcome Ian to our final AI Plus seminar titled AI in Healthcare from Bites to Bedside. Thanks, Ian. Okay, thanks very much, Anton, um, and uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me to uh, talk to the AI Collaboratory. Uh, it's a great honour, and uh, and I'm pleased to um, be talking about some of the things that um, have involved other folk, including Anton himself. Um, I, I guess that um, you know this slide is uh, probably redundant to most of you in the audience, but most of the applications that we're going to be talking about, and that where most of the focuses in relation to medicine for machine learning is uh, relates to supervised learning, uh, tasks of regression and classification. I think that uh, I sort of look at the functions of AIML in medicine as basically three types. First of all, to provide information for clinicians to use in their own decision-making processes. So for example, this, this is uh, an application of AI-RAD uh, to uh, looking at chest X-rays and other forms of imaging assisting radiologists and clinicians to focus on the areas of abnormality, um, to assist them in identifying what may be abnormal lesions, which then they can then decide how far they want to take it in terms of further investigation or what they think that most diagnostic uh, likelihood is. And then there's also to assist human decisions, uh, and where again, this is where uh, software is a little more advanced and actually pinpoints fractures that otherwise perhaps would have been missed by a radiologist or, or other clinician. So again, the clinician though does take final responsibility for the decision, but I think that uh, this uh, in this application we're actually identifying a fracture, for example, that otherwise perhaps would have been missed. And I think that um, that and finally I think is acting in place of the human expert. So this is more or less autonomous AI, and I think that uh, this has perhaps a little more limited scope at this stage. But for example, this is an application looking at um, retinopathy. Uh, diabetic retinopathy on retinal images, where software actually then uh, makes a recommendation to the clinician to refer a patient to an ophthalmologist because uh, the algorithm has identified proliferative diabetic retinopathy or macular degeneration, which then requires fairly urgent uh, review uh, by a specialist. So it's sort of semi-autonomous. The, um, the GP or the other person or the other health professional involved may still override, but basically uh, the algorithm has been shown in randomized trials to be very accurate and that the recommendation should be followed unless there's very good reason not to. 
Now, there's been a lot of progress in AI in healthcare in the sense that there's a lot of models and a lot of applications that are being developed. And this is sort of gives you a graph over the last uh, five to six years of how many AI applications in healthcare have been approved by various agencies in the USA and Europe. And you can see it's a fairly substantial rise, but was, and you know, there's now some hundreds of applications that have been approved. In Australia, they were still somewhat limited to automated retinopathy, uh, cardiac electrophysiology software that identifies uh, arrhythmias, for example, and image segmentation and lesion identification systems applied to applied to CT scanners and uh, and simple X-rays. So that's the only three types of uh, applications that we currently have approved by TGA. And yet, when you look at it, um, when we actually ask um, you know clinicians in Australia, so this is an Australian study of 305 ophthalmologists, 230 radiologists, and 97 dermatologists, asking them how, how much do you use AI in clinical practice? Given, as I said, that there's a number of applications now that uh, that uh, these people could use, and you can see it's uh, it's uh, it's a pretty low percentage that use AI or perhaps aware about AI in their practice at any one time, either in, in terms of monthly, weekly, or even daily use. So there seems to be then a bit of a chasm between, okay, the applications are there, but people aren't necessarily using them. This was a study done just recently, a systematic review of 51 studies of actual applied clinical applications. So these weren't sort of prototypes or models being developed, they were actually applied applications. And they ranged uh, across a number of different types of tasks from disease screening and triage, diagnosis, risk analysis and treatment. And you can, as you can see, a number of diseases and conditions have been targeted. And uh, you know, 24 of the 26 applications that reported um, performance said that it was satisfactory. Clinicians thought that yes, it does enhance my decision making and in some cases also improves workflow efficiencies. And uh, in the studies that we looked at, actual patient outcomes, yes, there were definite benefits. Very few studies on cost effectiveness. Uh, most of these studies were observational, but there were 13 randomized controlled trials, but uh, there was a level of moderate to high risk of bias. I think what this points out and what the authors sort of made reference to though is that we still have somewhat limited level one evidence to advocate for routine use of healthcare AI for decision support. And I think this is true. The actual number of randomized controlled trials that have looked at this, you know, you could uh, probably count on two hands, perhaps three hands at most. They need solid evidence base for its effectiveness before one, clinicians will trust it, and two, that the funders are prepared to pay for it. And also that any application needs to be coupled with effective patient-specific intervention. So I think we need to be careful that we don't get too carried away with risk prediction, when at the end of the day, well, if we say that this person is at high risk of something, can we actually intervene? Do we have uh, proven interventions that necessarily will give patients better care and a better outcome simply by refining their risk prediction. The, the generalizability and reproducibility of these algorithms is low and people, and people have referred to what they call the replication crisis of AI in the sense that it's often very hard for people to know exactly what the model is, what the code is, uh, can be replicated in our particular situation given our circumstances, equipment, etc. So there's a disconnect between the metrics on how we actually look at algorithm performance and the actual clinical context in which that model or that application may actually be applied to when we take into the account clinicians' workflows and how they actually make decisions. So all this is, I think, suggests an urgent need for healthcare AI research community to really work closely with clinicians and the institutions in which we would like to see those applications installed to really demonstrate the potential in real life clinical work. So that's why I'm very pleased to be able to work with data scientists, computer scientists, and very knowledgeable people like Anton. But at the same time, I can give a clinical context and I can say, is this really going to, in a way, pass the pub test and do clinicians going to see it as valuable? So what are the things that really are sort of, I guess, feed into this AI chasm? Well, first of all, I think there is limited AI literacy, particularly amongst the clinical community. And I think that's a challenge we need to address. And that's perhaps a responsibility of, of the college of physicians that I belong to. And that's why I'm keen to be on the Digital Health Advisory Committee to try to improve the literacy and then and the understanding of digital health and in particular AI in relation to clinicians. 
But we also need to realize that perhaps different stakeholders have different perceptions and expectations of AI, and they don't necessarily marry well. And unless we perhaps try to get some consensus and a more uniform appreciation of AI across the different range of stakeholders from clinicians, consumers, uh, fund holders, uh, healthcare managers, et cetera, then we're going to sort of have, find it difficult, I think, to gain widespread adoption. We have fragmented AI ecosystems. Um, I think we need to sort of coalesce a bit better than what we're doing at the moment. There's a lot of interest, a lot of divergent groups, um, different folk in this space, but we need to sort of try to bring it together. And also, I think our organisations, our healthcare organisations, uh, need to be made more ready and have the capacity to really adopt AI at scale. There's constraints in the AI application pipeline uh, from right from the beginning of design uh, through to uh, actually model development and, and validation, and then doing prospective evaluations and then doing actual clinical trials. Uh, this all takes time. There's ethical challenges. There's been a lot of focus on the ethics of AI, particularly in healthcare. And I think that sort of gives people pause for thought and uh, you know, the images of cyborgs taking over healthcare, I think a bit overplayed, but nevertheless, it is of concern to some. And there's underdeveloped regulatory guidance in terms of, for example, the TGA um, and uh, how it actually looks at and appraises and, uh, and approves software. I think uh, we're, uh, ML and AI are moving at a very fast pace and sometimes the regulators really are finding it hard to, to, to keep up. So let's talk about some of these, I think, a, a bit more drilled down. I think in terms of uh, AI literacy, this is a, a survey of 245 final year medical students in Australia, New Zealand and the US. And I think it's interesting that they all agree that, yes, we're going to see more AI. I, I do need to understand it. Uh, I think that, um, you know, it's going to play a bigger part in medicine going forward. But I do find it difficult to understand. And I'm not always sure that I uh, feel safe in using it. But I would like to learn more about it. And I think that uh, they consistently state that it's needed at all levels of training, that they will change practice, but that the faculty, in other words, our teachers and the people who actually supervise students and trainees don't necessarily have the expertise and skills in AI to really give them confidence in how it's been, how it's to be used. And moreover, there's a need for interdisciplinary training. So in other words, we need the data scientists, computer scientists, model developers, um, and perhaps sociologists, psychologists, ergonomic folk, there's been a number of disciplines that need to come together um, and actually help train people in how to use AI. I think that uh, the good news is, though, that uh, there has been, a, when you look at the literature and look at the mainstream uh, journals that clinicians read, there is now, I think, a number of articles that have sort of looked at machine learning. I just uh, Here's just a couple from my own group and what I've uh, been doing. But I think there's also, uh, when you look at the other specialty journals across cardiology, respiratory medicine, radiology, et cetera, there are now primers and articles talking about machine learning. So I think there is an effort uh, by certain groups and, and, the, and, and certain faculties to try to promulgate this message. And we have a whole host of courses uh, and online, including online courses and MOOCs and other things that actually now can provide further training in, in, at a qualification level, at certification level for people who have an interest in AI and healthcare. But I think we need to bear in mind that for many clinicians, they don't have the time or the resources to actually take themselves offline and do further and do for the further coursework. So we need to sort of, I think, um, you know, design training packages that are more applicable to a busy clinician. Talking about stakeholder perceptions, I mean, what do clinicians think of AI? Well, you know, we did a, uh, a review of this, a review of the literature of surveys that had been done, which we published uh, last year. And as you can see, there's both positive and negative perceptions. So yes, clinicians think that it's perhaps going to improve diagnostic accuracy and improve my workflow, hopefully it takes some of the mundanity and the administrative tasks out of my job, helps them uh, synthesize clinical information more quickly. I can update clinical records, particularly uh, electronic medical records more quickly, and hopefully then spend more time with patients because that's at the end of the day, that's what clinicians want to do. But their concern though is that, well, what about AI causing errors that I don't understand or can't appreciate? Uh, tr training, professional development comes out. Perhaps some people are worried about reputational loss that uh, machine learning will be a form of do-it-yourself medicine and therefore there won't be as much demand for specialist opinion. Uh, could it erode empathetic communication with patients? So people spending more time on computers and less time actually talking to patients. And about the risk of privacy breaches, loss of confidentiality, and also just wanting to know, is there definite proof of efficacy of this application in my clinical setting? And do I actually understand how this thing has come to the predictions it has? 
Similarly, when we ask patients, consumers, what they think of AI, again, there's both positive and negative. So can patients and consumers think, well, if AI can act as a second opinion to clinicians and therefore yield better decisions, I don't have a problem and can improve my access to care also. But they're also concerned about the dehumanization of the relationship, uh, the threat to shared decision making. So who's in this room now? It's a three way room, me, uh, the doctor and the computer. Uh, lost of trustworthiness of AI advice or low trustworthiness of AI advice. And also just concern that do the clinicians have sufficient oversight. And also can the um, AI be biased in a way that then unfairly allocates treatments or allocates care to different patient groups. So in this, I think we're going to have to look at an AI checklist for clinicians and consumers. Um, and I think some, these are the basic questions uh, that uh, we wrote about. First of all, we have to always ask what this application will do for me and my patient. And that's where I think it's important that the, that the AI community, the AI researchers talk to clinicians at the very beginning, because we will ask you, what problem is this AI application supposed to solve? What will it do and will it lighten my burden? or the patient's burden or both of us. So, you know, is it going to give us more efficiency, satisfaction, better care, better patient experience and better clinical outcomes? So what's the, what's the problem that it's trying to solve? So I think in my reading of the literature is that sometimes models have been developed without that fundamental question being asked. And at the end of the day, people ask, this is not going to help me. I don't see the point of it. Trustworthiness, can I trust this AI application? So how accurate and confident are its predictions and are they free of bias and are they better than what we can do now now if an AI application is no better than a good human a good expert human um, in, a, in, a, in a normal work a day if it can't do better than what they're already doing then again it's it's for naught and in particular uh, people don't want to have an AI application that actually may um, you know predict erroneously so has the performance been evaluated in patients and settings that are similar to mine? And I think one of the big uh, challenges we have if we develop an MI model, is it uh, translatable to other settings and other patient populations? And has it been shown not to cause harm? And if it does cause an error, then who's liable for the harm that that may then result? Intelligibility, do the workings and the predictions of this AI application make sense to me? So can I easily interpret can I explain and understand how these predictions were generated? Because if I have to turn around to the patient and say, well, um, you know, this uh, risk prediction tool that I'm working on seems to indicate that you're at high risk of this or that. And they'll ask, well, how do you know that? Um, and what are the things that make this uh, instrument think that I'm going to be at higher risk? And I think clinicians will be a little bit hesitant to say, well, I really don't know. It's a total black box. I don't understand it. Uh, well, clearly that's going to cause some concern. Respect and autonomy, how much respect and choice does this AI application give me? So I think again, uh, and we found this from our own surveys that uh, patients and clinicians want to have some oversight and their clinical judgment needs to be respected. So how, so under what circumstances do I reject or override the advice or the actions of that AI application? And to some extent, we don't want clinicians to become totally devoid of the skill to make their own decisions. Does this application fit easily into clinical workflows and operating environments? And again, that's where I think when we look at implementation studies of AI, that's where a lot, of, a lot of things fall down. It doesn't easily fit into the workflow. Does it self-activate? Does it self-populate? How much training do I need to actually be able to use this uh, instrument? Who's capable of using it? And also what are the resource costs? And that's what the managers will say. If I'm going to spend a lot of money putting this application into EMR or into another platform, um, is it worth it? And finally, sustainability, what's the life cycle of this AI application? And again, I think that's often a, a bit of a lost or second cousin in the sense that who's going to take ownership and ensure that this particular application is going to be kept up to date? Because one thing we know for sure, that clinical practice will continue to change. And we have obviously a whole uh, range of data set shifts that uh, result from different circumstances, changes in practice, change in demographics, et cetera. So who's going to make sure that this application stays well calibrated? Who's going to pay for that? And what's the governance structure around that? Let me move on to the ecosystems. So there are some foundational requirements in AI ML. First of all, I think we need workforce capacity and expertise. And I think we've already covered that. And as you can see, it involves a range of disciplines coming together because AI is a socio-technical ecosystem. It's not just a simple intervention. 
Um, and we know that, uh, and it doesn't apply just to AI, it applies to even electronic medical records, for example. And even now, people, some people would argue that EMR necessarily hasn't provided the potential that, uh, it, that we thought it had. We certainly need interoperable data sources, data storage, data analytics. And this again, I think is another constraint. We have so many different databases out there and different digital platforms, but they don't speak necessarily well to one another. And it's hard to transmit data across and, uh, and, and be able to uh, analyze in a uniform way. Computational capacity, I think is certainly becoming less of a problem. We have now supercomputers and uh, we have uh, terrific uh, instruments that can really pump things out. Mind you, they take a bit of electricity. You might be interested to know that about 4% of um, carbon emissions is actually due to our current computational data bases and, um, and computer systems around the world. And that's expected to double in the next few years. So that's something to think about in the sense that we need to have a bit of an environmental impact. Think about you know, this increased use of, uh, of computer informatics. Governance structures. So you know, who's actually having oversight? How do we make sure that from an ethical, regulatory, legal point of view, uh, we have a sort of uniform consensus around how to tackle these issues? Reliable long-term funding and the frameworks. And then finally, I think patient and public involvement, because at the end of the day, uh, consumers who are becoming tech savvy, and there's a lot of people out there who can handle themselves very well on their smartphones and uh, devices, but they still, I think, need to have some input into what is this application going to do for me and, and what's been my role in trying to make sure that it's designed well. So, you know, just uh, I guess looking at our own experience, we have a number of groups in Metro, uh, across Metro South and Queensland Health working on different things, somewhat related. Uh, we have uh, other um, specific initiatives at HHS level and with various consultancies and other academic discipline and specific groups as well. And we have the UQ Smart Project, for example. So UQ is now, I think, very much involved in digital health and AI, and there's been a number of very successful grants and uh, centres now being set up. E-Health in Queensland Health also has their clinical and business intelligence group, and they're very keen as well to be involved in AI. And then on the outside, we have the academic groups like the Digital Health CRC. We have the CSIRO, Health E-Health Research Centre, Data61. We've got the Queensland AI Hub. And we have these other institutions around the nation that also have a particular um, place in research experience around AI. And I just kind of think somehow we need to bring all these various groups together. So let me put it to you that perhaps we should have a Queensland AI for Health collaborative where I think certainly those groups that are situated here in Queensland need to sort of get together as a regular group so that we're not make, so we're making sure that we're not duplicating, we're not overlapping, uh, we're not going off in separate ways doing much the same thing because I think that in a way fragments the effort and dilutes the resources. So perhaps we need to bring ourselves together into one centralized collaborative. In terms of organizational readiness and capacity, um, I think we know that you know, the technology changes at an exponential rate, but organizations change at a logarithmic rate. So this gap continues to widen over time. And I think um, it's fair to say that even though most uh, healthcare institutions are wanting to respond to new technology and clinicians themselves are often very ready to accept uh, new technologies that are well proven and actually add value but the organizations can sometimes lag in terms of their readiness to take this on and it may not just be financial it may be just in the way that the organization is structured and what infrastructure physical and uh, and uh, and uh, electronic infrastructure they have available to them so in, a, in an article that we published a little while ago, we looked at, okay, what are the features that might be helpful to do to, to look at organizational readiness and capacity? So these were the domains we talked about. So, you know, in relation to a particular form of AI, how relevant is it to the problems that that particular institution or HHS is interested in, organizational leadership, culture, the actual technology infrastructure, the data quality from EMR, okay, what analytic capacity we have, are we concerned about cybersecurity? Okay, what about the development of life cycle for this? And what are the team competencies and financial resources? So there were the domains we sort of chose. And just as an example then, we sort of applied this, uh, this uh, matrix to our Metro South, right, to our Metro South clinical informatics. So as you can see, the, the matrix is from one, where for each of these domains now, the organization is well below par, up to five, which is sort of excellent state of the art. 
And what we found was, well, we do well in some things, but not so well in others. So as you can see, we're not sitting at four and five across the across all those domains. Uh, they're a bit uh, all over the place. So I think in that sense, if we're going to, uh, again, uh, be able to uh, really take on AI at scale, we all need our institutions to kind of look at this matrix, self-assess, and then say, right, what can we do to move ourselves more to the right? Now, the AI ML application pipeline is not an easy one, as we're all finding out. Um, so the, the uh, top, top diagram sort of makes it look fairly simple that we sort of generate data, and we train the algorithm, and we validate it internally and externally and then do an RCT and then we deploy it and uh, and then hopefully continue uh, uh, keeping an eye on it and, and, uh, and calibrating it as required. But I think more recently, there's now a bit more of a stepwise process that we need to go through in terms of, well, we have in silico model development and evaluation, but then we need to look at silent and shadow or perspective evaluation, then do an early live clinical evaluation as a sort of feasibility study, uh, just to make sure that this does this really work in real time. Then we need to, need to do a comparative perspective evaluation. In other words, that's really comparing then against best standard care to make sure that this application, yes, we've now got it working, it seems to work okay, it's feasible, we've worked out the workflow issues and the data feeds and so forth. But then is it still better than what the best clinician can, can do at the moment? And that all takes time. And there's a lot of constraints in that pipeline. And I think an important one that we can't ever lose sight of, and that is external validation. And I think you all are aware of the EPIC trial, which really showed that if you don't um, take an application and really make sure that it works outside the centers in which it was trained and used, and also to make sure that it's calibrated over time, then it can start causing some major problems. So the EPIC sepsis model, and we have a particular interest in sepsis at uh, Metro South, and uh, that uh, was shown actually to be giving very erroneous predictions. And as a result, uh, it was actually suspended. So what are the constraints in that application pipeline? And I really break it down into sort of three stages or three miles. The first mile is actually defining the task, defining the use case, and then looking at uh, how we're gonna collect, process, curate, and label the data. And a lot of that takes a lot of time on the part of data scientists. And I think for our data scientists folk, that's probably the most laborious bit of their work. Um, and perhaps to some extent, the least enjoyable part of the work. But once it's done on a large data set, then you can certainly then use it for multiple tasks. So, but there's not necessarily uh, uh, getting away from this first step. It, it, it's, it is hard enough, but does it need to be? And I'm gonna talk, talk about things that perhaps can make that uh, route a little easier. The second mile is, I think, now relatively easy in terms of feature selection, engineering, and model development refinement. We've got now excellent tools that can do this very quickly um, and reliably, and we can um, validate internally. And with the access to, for example, electronic medical records in Queensland across multiple digital hospitals, we can also do a fair bit of external and multi-site validation as well, using though uh, at uh, using retrospective um, static data. So most of our models are in silico and they're based on retrospective data. The third mile is where it really gets tricky, and it's really hard, and very few have done it. So. We've now got the application, but we now want to make sure how do we interface it with our current EMR or other systems? Is it feasible? And have we tested the usability of this in terms of the end user? Okay, now let's implement it with live data in silent mode and just check to see how accurate it is. In other words, perspective valuation. Okay, then if that seems to be okay, then we then move to an active mode and then we do a effectiveness trial and either as a randomized trial, but you can do other designs such as before or after or interrupted time series. And then we deploy and then ongoing monitor. This is the hardest bit. And this is where most applications have not been able to reach. All right, so in terms of the data, um, this was the timeline in relation to the AI, the sepsis algorithm that Paul Lane and Rudy Shetner and Vikrant Kelty had worked on a couple of years ago. And this was their sort of journey in, as they imagined it would be in relation to getting ethical approval, uh, getting approval from the various data custodians to access data from EMR from different HHSs, uh, get across the Public Health Act, and then get regional government, uh, re, uh, you know, the site governance officers to sign off on it. And they thought there's a the timeline and it's fairly linear. And what actually happened, that was like this. So they were going back and forth 
having to do multiple uh, emails, multiple messages to various folk. Um, and as a result, the timeline just blew out um, beyond what they thought was going to be about four to six months. Well, it turned out to be a lot longer than that. And I just think, well, you know, if we have this much trouble just getting access to the data, uh, let alone actually then developing and validating the model, then we're, we're going to take, we're going to waste a lot of time. And Narelle Dawes from eHealth Queensland in 2019 admitted that this is a significant barrier um, and we need to really streamline this. Uh, and I know that, um, uh, that Claire Sullivan, for example, in the UQ uh, Smart AI Hub has spent a fair bit of time trying to work out, okay, this Byzantine process, how can we streamline it? How can we uh, get uh, a more uh, standardized approach to data access? So, I mean, I think there are things that we could do. So perhaps we need a single Queensland Health Ethics approval process rather than going through different HHSs and a single digital data custodian and authorizer because all the data from EMR can, is held and can be stored on servers in eHealth Queensland. So we have a centralized source. So why do we then need different data custodians at a HHS level to tell us, can we access the data? So can we have a data repository and a sharing platform with real-time accessibility and a centralized approval coordination, uh, approval and coordination uh, center, for example? To me, this uh, idea uh, sounds very reasonable, uh, but I think it does uh, require some folk to say, right, uh, we may have to give up some of our, um, our, I guess, jurisdiction in some of these areas uh, for the sake of making it a more streamlined process. So we want a decision. So what we'd like is perhaps a decision tree algorithm that provides all these benefits in relation to fluidity of data, access to it and standardization. I think the other thing is um, this whole thing about patient consent. And that's why I think eHealth and other organizations are very sensitive about giving data to outside parties or external researchers, because they're always concerned that patient data is gonna get in the hands of a third party that will then be malused. And we're, and we're aware of the Cambridge Analytica and University of Chicago examples where this has happened. I think we just need to inform the public, okay, that, that in a digital hospital, uh, we would like to be able to use your electronic data in an anonymized, de-identified fashion for the purposes of quality and safety improvement to develop new models of care and new instruments that help in your care. And we will remove any personal health information from that metadata and we won't be giving it to any commercial third parties and any application will be for the common good. It won't be monetized. It won't be, you know, a, made a, made a, a Queensland Health won't be using it to make a profit. You know, when you talk to patients, if you put it in those words, no one has a trouble. No one has any difficulty then saying, that's fine, I'm happy to consent. And we actually make it opt out. So in other words, if, if someone is more sensitive about these matters and doesn't want their data used, period, okay, we get them to sign the form and that's it, their particular record then is quarantined and never accessed. But that's a very small minority. And I think we need to move to this sort of opt out patient consent. And that gets rid of the whole ethics issue. Um, if we can optimize the structuredness of data, source, data sources. So I think one of the things if we had our time again with EMR was to make sure there was uh, a bit more uh, uniformity in data definitions, data dictionaries, and the way that uh, we actually organize the data in terms of filing nomenclatures, uh, coding nomenclatures, the use of you know, templates and power plants. Uh, uh, the EMR came in and was very unstructured. And I think perhaps if we had our time over again, we perhaps would have made this a little more easy in terms of its structuredness. Nevertheless, what may save us a little bit is natural language processing. And I think that that, that has come to the fore and there is re good research showing that yes, you can get a lot of data from unstructured EMRs using NLP. Employing unified data formats. Uh, so for example, fire should be you know, routine. Um, we haven't got there yet, um, but it has been shown. And I think it, as far as I can understand, it's still the best form of API for aggregating data from different sources. So let's use it. And I believe there has been uh, recently uh, money obtained um, to look at fire applications in relation to general practitioner databases and others to make us in more interoperable with uh, sources outside Queensland Health. Dynamic graphic databases rather than relational databases and flat files, I think are the way to go. Um, and I think interrogating data sets for quality. So there's new tools now that can say, right, uh, I can just screen this data set very quickly and reject data that is of poor quality. In other words, missing data or outliers or things that really don't make any sense, then perhaps then the data then can be streamed out. 
and optimize variable selection and required data, knowing that at the end of the day, clinical experts will need to inform um, the model developers to say there are certain things that I know from experience and from good research that you need to include in your model. Uh, these are good predictors. Okay, and I've had my an experience myself uh, working with some data scientists um, who didn't perhaps understand or didn't appreciate that there were certain things that I knew had an effect on patient outcome, but that they weren't considering in their model, either because the data wasn't available or because it was perhaps not too easy to access. But nevertheless, it was pretty central and pretty critical to the performance of that algorithm. I think uh, automating model development where possible certainly can help. We have now auto ML tools of various sorts that can certainly, I think, streamline the process of feature pre-processing uh, uh, pre and selection and construction, et cetera, and looking at optimizing hyperparameters. There's things out there such as DPOT, driverless AI, data robot, which we're using here at Metro South, Autoglucon, and, and of course the Microsoft Azure and other platforms are now making I think much easier to try to uh, you know, uh, develop and models more quickly. And I think that um, as a result, we now have uh, a, a, a new era of so-called no-code AI process, such as MakerPad and ZeroCode, no-code, which you probably know more about than I do. But I think what it does mean is that we have to then, okay, choose between, okay, how we, we have to be careful that uh, in these uh, using these new tools that we don't necessarily just then go for the fast and cheapest options. At the end of the day, we're still going to have an accurate model, okay? And at the end of the day, none of these tools are going to be helpful if the data that's going in is garbage or is not appropriate. Open source libraries, I think, um, you know, are certainly should be used. Uh, in other words, that's how we learn. And that's, and I think anyone who has an AI application and is publishing it should always make the code available to others so they can replicate it and see whether it reproduces in their particular circumstance. Transfer learning, I think, has uh, also, I think, got a potential so that, you know, a model developed for one task using a specific data set. Well, you know, if we make it available open source and use it as a base model, can we then retrain that base model on data that's been used for a similar or related task rather than start from scratch? And then also there's emphasis on federated learning. Um, and I think this has been particularly pushed because it gets around the data privacy issue in the sense that the data stays with the, with the local custodian. It's not actually then transferred to a central repository. I'm not so sure that the necessarily that this is the way to go. I think that um, 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 I'm just forgetting his name. But anyway, uh, I think Professor Gilman, I think it was some little while ago, at one of the digital health grand rounds was talking about comparing federated versus centralized learning um, in relation to EMR data. So where we have EMR data from a number of hospitals at the moment, we can collect it centrally. The centralized approach seemed to actually perform better in terms of model performance rather than federated learning. So federated learning may not necessarily apply to everything, uh, but I think when you're dealing with perhaps rare diseases or rare, rare cases, or where you have specific populations that are concentrated in certain regions, okay, then federated learning uh, definitely, I think, may have a role to play. And this is, for example, one model that was predicting need for respiratory support at ED presentation in COVID patients. And as you can see that, you know, the, the average um, performance as error of the curve was 0.79, but when you actually did federated learning and then fed back and and got a central model then to be uh, to you know to be further refined, as a result of feeding back those um, those uh, weights and coefficients from the from the um, peripheral sites, that the uh, error in the curve became much better. So, federated learning in its place, I think, has a role to play. What about add-on apps rather than reconfiguring the whole EMR platform? So when we actually come to then test in real world practice, okay, how can we then apply that to our EMR platform? At the moment, if we want to change the EMR platform, the CERNA platform here in Queensland Health, we've got to go through a very uh, tortuous uh, approval process because it's a statewide system. Uh, and we have to then get approval from each HHSs uh, to make sure that they're happy with that change. Um, I think that uh, CERNA has realised that if they're going to, to uh, maintain market share, that they've got to be a lot more flexible and they've got to have uh, the ability to have smart applications that, that can be hooked on using HLR Fire right, to their platform rather than us having to reconfigure the platform. So I think they've seen that as uh, in certainly in the US and I'm hopeful that uh, this will also come to Australia so that the CERNA platform here can become a lot more flexible and able to host these different applications that we can then test more quickly. 
What about ethical challenges? Um, yeah, sure, there are some, there's no doubt. But I think sometimes I ask myself this, um, we've had these same ethical challenges in relation to a lot of other digital tools or even non-digital tools uh, that we currently use in clinical practice. Um, you know, we may have evidence that's inconclusive. We may have things that we don't quite understand. As a clinician, do I understand how the MRI machine works? Can I explain it to my patient? Well, no, I can't. I can talk it in basic terms, but it's the radiologist who knows it in detail because he's the person or she's the person that's actually using it. But I still use MRI. I would order an MRI at least twice a week. Why? Because I've learned to trust it. Um, it gives me useful information and it makes me more diagnostically proficient. And I can then also explain to patients, this is your problem and this is what we're going to do about it. So I think sometimes the, the bar set for AI in relation to ethics is perhaps being a set a bit too high. I understand why, because it's a very powerful tool and you can apply it at scale across a whole range uh, of different topics and different uh, uh, disease conditions and very large populations. So you don't want it to, 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 um, you know, to make errors too frequently. But on the other hand, if we know that the tool gives better care makes better decisions right, in a much a greater a much greater frequency than what we can do now with just clinicians in standard practice, then I think, well, let's then move forward. Uh, we don't want to make perfection um, the bar that then paralyzes all AI efforts. Having said that, I understand that we do need to make sure that there's no bias ingrained bias, particularly in the data that's fed into the AI application in the first place. So it comes back to that fundamental question. And we've got to make sure the data that goes in, okay, is fully representative of the populations in which we may then want to apply any model that comes out. So I think we need to basically understand how it works. So that's why the clinicians need to have a basic fluency about the technology, build patient trust, and that's through a patient doctor relationship and transparent about the fact I'm using AI to help in my decision making, in our decision making, that clinicians understand the problems in which the training data that came in, where that data come from, what sort of patients was it about, uh, what data was missing that I think is important that may be relevant to my decision making, for example, and was it obtained ethically? Well, obtained ethically by having an opt-out rule and then mitigate the bias. So we need to understand, yes, what are the common sources of bias? Right? And that's a responsibility not only of clinicians, but obviously of data and computer scientists who are involved in AI to understand those different forms of bias and how we guard against that. And there's some very good articles um, that I think look at that whole question, which I've shared with Anton and others. Um, and I think if we apply those rules, then okay, we're doing the best we can. Again, no tool, and AI included, is ever going to be 100% foolproof or 100% accurate. It's a human system, so it's going to have its faults. But at the end of the day, if we've done, if we've gone through these different steps and we've assured ourselves as much as we can that this model works well, and certainly it is giving us better care than what we would otherwise do, then fair enough. Okay, in relation to the regulatory changes for software and et cetera, well, the TGA is working on this. They've released, in fact, a number of different discussion papers in the last uh, six or eight months and more to come. And we in the AI world need to maintain an open dialogue with TGA so that as we sort of move into outside of a research uh, ethics um, sort of environment, once we move into a live real world testing environment, we need to make sure the TGA is aware of what we're doing uh, because they're also wanting to help us as we are wanting to help them because they also realize this is a very fast moving field Okay, it's going to be hard for us to keep up, but we do need to have some oversight and some principles by which we determine how to govern. Okay, so um, just finishing up um, in the last little while, um, I just want to talk and just give you some examples of use cases that we're currently uh, that we're currently working on um, here at Metro South. So one is, for example, we know ED congestion is a major problem, and uh, what we'd like to do is to have people spending less time in ED and more time actually in inpatient wards or actually discharged and sent home. 
So this is a, um, a working group that's looking at an AI application of trying to identify patients who come into ED, who we know, right, from the first set of observations within the first hour, for example, that this patient is very likely to require admission and therefore we start the patient flow process of you know, deciding which unit this patient's gonna go to, uh, which bed they're gonna be assigned to, okay, so that we can then start booking the bed and getting ready for that patient to be moved on, rather than as we do now, we kind of wait until three to four hours are done after ED have assessed the patient and perhaps consulted a specialty team and they've come down and had a look and said, yep, this patient does need to be admitted. Okay, well, we could have identified this some time ago. And also, which patients are more likely then to be discharged? Okay, so if a patient comes in, right, I think this patient can be turned around, right, we take them out of the acute resource cubicle, out of the acute area and perhaps put them in an ambulatory care area and then we work on them there. So in terms of this ED disposition and ED length of stay, uh, we, this model has uh, been shown based on historical data and real time um, data that is historical as in their past history and also what we've now gathered from their first observations in ED, we can pretty well determine who's gonna come into hospital and who isn't. And we can also decide who's gonna have the longer length of stay in ED using real time model. So, the, the predictions are generated within the first 30 minutes, sometimes may take a little longer, 60 minutes, depending on the triage process. Okay, but uh, I think this has real potential to enable us to improve patient flow through EDs. One that we're very keen on that we've been working on now for some time is trying to identify patients with sepsis. So we know that sepsis is bad. It affects about 8% of inpatients and it has a high mortality and quite a few patients end up in ICU. But we also know that about 30% of these episodes are preventable if we identify patients who are developing sepsis before they actually clinically deteriorate and activate a MET call. And there's been a number of models that have looked at trying to identify sepsis patients that have uh, in randomized trials included, have been shown to decrease mortality and length of stay, but none have undergone validation feasibility testing in an Australian setting. So Paul Lane and colleagues in Townsville a couple of years ago worked on this, took a CEC model from New South Wales, and then used four years of data from 10 digital hospitals and to develop this algorithm called Catherine. That could identify up that identify patients with incipient sepsis up to 48 hours before they actually then activated a MET call. Now, I think this is really um, groundbreaking stuff in the sense that if we can, and this was looking at, um, you know, um, uh, as I said, data for over four years, 1.13 million encounters and uh, 26,000 cases of sepsis identify, uh, uh, defined by sepsis three and with a mortality rate of 10%. So we know, and there's good evidence to show that the earlier you get in, and, uh, and, and, and manage a patient with incipient sepsis by taking blood cultures and serum lactates and giving IV fluids and IV antibiotics, you can definitely improve outcomes. So we're in the process now of doing a prospective validation using real-time data from three HHSs and from which then hopefully we'll then develop a prototype application. But it's taking time and it hasn't been easy. And uh, again, a fair bit of the lag to date has been trying to get uh, the various data custodians and CBI, for example, to actually allow us to have the data uh, because it's near real time. It's not actually interfering with the live EMR environment. It's near real time, but nevertheless, okay, it is not just retrospective static data. Here's another application that uh, David Cook and uh, Ada Brankovink have just recently published about. This was uh, perhaps also looking at patients who will activate a MET call, not due to sepsis, but due, but not just to sepsis, but due to other things. And uh, we know that, um, you know, at the moment we use trick and, uh, track and trigger systems, uh, the early warning systems. In Queensland, we use CUD, the CUDAX at the moment, the Queensland Adult Deterioration Detection System. And we know that um, about 70% of these patients who have met call will transfer to ICU and one in eight will actually die. But we also know that early identification of these patients may allow preventive intervention with better outcomes and then, the, uh, and, and then fewer met calls. So there have been models that have developed that outperform conventional early warning systems, but they usually look at um, uh, as, an, as the outcome measure um, reductions in ICU transfers, cardiac arrests, or deaths. But it'd be preferable to try to develop a model that can, again, identify patients at risk of deterioration who may activate a MET up to eight hours before deterioration becomes manifest. And that's what their model has, uh, has been able to achieve. So they, as you can see, uh, they can, they can um, uh, you know, uh, pick up a patient at eight hours out from when they were supposed to activate a MET call uh, with a very high level of precision. 
Okay, and also in this, they're able to make the model explainable to clinicians and actually identify different phenotypes. So, so one of this particular patient here, for example, was more at risk of, um, of sepsis. And this patient, for example, was more at risk of uh, hypervolemia and bleeding as the cause for their deterioration. So this I think is a, a kind of nice application since it not only does it give us a, high, a, a larger time window before deterioration occurs, but it actually identifies, okay, what is the most likely cause for this patient's uh, uh, tendency to become um, unstable? And therefore what might be then the best interventions then to apply? Now, obviously this is still early days. Again, it's static, it's in silico. Okay, we have yet to develop an application. What we have worked on uh, more recently is a weight-based dosing nomogram for heparin, because we know that heparin, when people, uh, when the clinicians prescribe heparin, uh, we only get the therapeutic APTT right, that's a measure of sufficient anticoagulation and safe anticoagulation in about one in five patients. So it's a real trial and error, and as a result, patients may go then, you know, 36, 48, even longer before finally they're in a stable therapeutic APTT range because heparin has, uh, has a very variable response according to the individual. So we've been working, and we've just published just recently, a model that tried to uh, estimate, okay, if you give a certain bolus and maintenance dose of heparin, what's the likelihood that they're going to be within therapeutic range, okay, within the next 8 to 12 hours? And with this model, we've been able, with an ensemble model, okay, we've been able to get a reasonable level of accuracy, perhaps not as good as we would like, like it. Um, and that's mainly because there was significant class imbalance due to underrepresentation of the high APTTs. But nevertheless, we could identify, okay, where patients were being underdosed with pretty high accuracy. And therefore, the clinician then is to readjust their dose and say, no, this isn't going to be sufficient. I need to increase it further uh, with guidance in terms, of a, in terms of an appropriate nomogram. So at least this is the first step showing that, OK, we know it's quite inaccurate and perhaps this model could help us then get patients within therapeutic range. And that's certainly the biggest concern, leaving people open to further thrombosis because they're not getting sufficient levels of heparin. And early identification of patients at risk of medication harm. Uh, we have a real problem, particularly in older patients with polypharmacy and people who are at risk of uh, developing adverse drug events. So we've done a systematic review and we've developed a model that has a reasonable accuracy in determining who's going to be at risk of an adverse drug event while in hospital. We're now applying machine learning methods to further refine that model. And we've just uh, applied recently for a grant uh, for us to be able to validate that model in a real world setting. And then finally, AI RAD, the application of, uh, of uh, AI to um, x-rays and CT scans in particular, uh, to try to lessen radiologists' time spent on actual screening films and, doing, and deciding what's abnormal and what's not. And we can see that, in fact, uh, the accuracy in terms of image, uh, image segmentation and lesion identification is certainly much higher. And uh, there's a group at the moment here at Radiology in Metro South who are applying this, uh, this uh, software to CT and MRI scans, CT in the first instance. And uh, we'll be very interested to see how much it improves reduction in reporting times and detection of previously missed lesions. All right, so in conclusion, I think the key messages are we need clinician engagement and more literacy in AIML, stakeholder charter that applies to both clinicians and the consumer. Perhaps, you know, we should look at a statewide AI research and development collaborative that does the things that were listed there. And also we need to really push the organizational responsiveness to, to, to look at AI seriously and see where is it actually going to apply best. And I think the issues for consideration going forward is do we do this in a house only or do we really need to partner with commercial vendors? Because we, we know that Google and Amazon and Microsoft, these are very big companies and they're moving the field very quickly. So uh, we're going to sort of just basically leave ourselves just in house with our own groups working on this or do we need to bring in the commercial vendors? There's all sort of issues around, you know, contracts and IP and commercialization, I think gets people a little bit hesitant. And certainly I think uh, Queen of Health is not too keen on having information or data given to commercial vendors. But uh, on the other hand, we have a CERNA platform that was a commercial vendor, all right? So, you know, we do use the things that uh, third parties have made um, because they're the commercial entities and they've got the scale. So I think we need to work out some way we can partner with them. Do we look at Queensland only or do we look at multi-state collaboration? Because I think, again, uh, we're a small country with a relatively small population and a relatively small research community. So might we be better off trying to coalesce and bring the different entities across the states together as a collaboration? 
do we stay with on-prem or do we go to SaaS, ICE and PaaS? And I think at the end of the day, the cloud technology and again, the utility of the large vendors, I think we can't underestimate the power that they can provide us. So I think the on-prem, again, kind of gives us a sense of security and safeness and we're just working with our own data. But at the end of the day, if we're really going to, again, scale this and be able to move things quickly, perhaps we need to also consider getting at uh, using the cloud. Project phase versus life cycle management. I think that's an open-ended question as to who's going to take responsibility for life cycle maintenance. Explainability versus trust. I think there's a balance there. Deep learning, you'll never be able to explain to clinicians. Um, it's hard even for us, I think, to understand deep learning. All right, But we do need to at least have a certain level of explainability as to what were the major features or predictors within this model that gets it to make this recommendation. I think that's a, a minimum. But at the end of the day, clinicians will trust something and they may not be they may not want to understand it in detail as long as it's been shown to be of proven reliability and worth. And I think we also have to bear in mind not only the current care challenges, but what AI is going to have to look at in medicine over the next five to 10 years, because the, the, the clinical practice will change, new technologies will come on board, and perhaps even consumers will change as well in terms of their expectations and their needs. So we need to also be mindful of that and not just look at the current care challenges. So with that, I'll, um, I'll open to questions. And thanks very much, Anton. Ian, thank you very much. Uh, that was really informative. And uh, I think it was great to just get a, a real um, view across the whole clinical AI landscape from sort of woe to go. Um, I think for people maybe who um, are not uh, fully aware of what's happening in the clinical AI area, um, you've given a really broad and comprehensive uh, coverage of that. Thank you very much. Um, so we open it up now to uh, anybody who's got some questions. I've got one here at the moment uh, on the board, but if anybody else wanted to add their questions up in the Q&A area of your Zoom, that would be great. Um, I've got one here from Vivian. She says, what do you think medical students can do to bridge the gap between AI and similar digital transformations in healthcare in the future beyond improving personal AI literacy early on? Um, well, I think, you know, I'm sure there's some pretty tech savvy students um, and we know that, um, you know, some of them have a real interest in AI. Indeed, in, uh, on our Metro South Clinical AI Working Group, we've got a student um, who wanted to join us. Um, we also have an intern too. So I think, you know, given the opportunity, um, these folk would be happy to, to help us. I mean, it comes down to again, well, they also have core curricula and core training requirements. So, you know, how much time can they spend on this? Um, I think it's up to universities and also perhaps to colleges as well to give some protected time to this sort of activity, to say this, this is core curriculum. Uh, and I know that uh, in the MD redesign, I'm involved in that too. Now, we're, so we're putting in a new medical course as from 2025. So, um, so sorry, 2023 actually, uh, next year. So in that sense, we've sort of included digital skills as an essential part of that. So it's not just optional. It's saying, no, you need to understand this because this is coming. Um, and I think that, and similarly for the College of Physicians, we're doing exactly the same thing. So we've now defined a number of digital competencies and, um, and entrustable professional activities, so-called, but basically things that you can measure in terms of how people are literate and also, but also uh, competent in using digital tools of one sort or another, including EMRs, but also that includes AI as well. Mm. Great. Thank you. Um, I've got another question here from Van Tai Nguyen. Um, what accuracy of ML or AI model is likely to be accepted for deployment? In the oh, question, yeah, yeah. he's got in brackets there, 90 slash 95%. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, well, it all depends on their context, okay? So where you have, you know, uh, time-sensitive, serious life-impacting decisions, well, it's going to be have to be pretty accurate, okay? So perhaps no, 95, 98% accurate. If you're looking at, say, more risk prediction or you're looking at a more less um, critical sort of issue, well, perhaps then lower level of accuracy, if it's substantially better than what we can already do now. That's the question, all right? So if we're, you know, say in, in the case of heparin, we only get it right one in five of the time. If the tool can get us up to, say, uh, eight out of 10, okay, so it's still not 90, 95% accurate, but it's certainly a lot better than what we can do now, well, we'd use it. Um, so I think it depends on the current level of practice, what's our current level of accuracy, okay? And then how much more can we get based on the criticality of the situation that we're dealing with, 
right? So yes, we don't want AI to give us bad predictions in a lot of occasions, right? Where the, where the right decision really can have a major impact on a patient's life or death, clearly. So I think it, it'll, and I think when you look at the levels of stringency around the evidence base for AI applications, there's a gradient, right? According to how critical is the decision that you're talking about. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, question here from Guido. Um, what's your opinion on the most promising use cases of NLP on AHR data? Mm. Um, probably risk prediction. I, I don't think it's necessarily, um, people have looked at, you know, can it diagnose, um, can it improve diagnostics? Um, in particular, people have said, look, we know that when people come into ED, right, and the emergency physician has a provisional diagnosis and that's how they're gonna then manage the patient. And then we look at, okay, what was then the final diagnosis when the patient got discharged from hospital after say three or four or five days of inpatient care? We know the concordance between the emergency physician diagnosis and the final discharge diagnosis is probably no more than about 60, 65%. Okay, now, if we could use NLP, all right, because uh, earlier on and improve the diagnostics, okay, that would certainly, I think, help, but that may avoid some unnecessary intervention that wasn't appropriate. And people have looked at that, um, but the research is still a little bit icky. I think in terms of risk prediction, just simply saying, okay, do you think this patient is going to die during this admission? You know, what's their risk of death? And therefore, perhaps you need to focus on this patient a little more than someone who has a lower risk of death. I think NLP, uh, from my reading of the research, is doing that now fairly well. So perhaps as a risk prediction tool, yes, it's got, uh, it's got more legs at the moment. Okay, great. We've just got a little bit more time uh, in. So what's uh, here's one from Diana Hermit. Um, what's your opinion on AI ML models developed in-house compared to using cloud platforms such as Azure or Databricks? Okay, I must admit, I, I'm not an expert there. I, I, I'm not, I guess I'm not the person who can really talk to that. Uh, if I had Brent Richards, I don't know whether Brent's on, he could probably talk better than that. And uh, perhaps Gudo and others also could uh, are more authoritative. I mean, I think, I just think that based on some of the applications I've seen, particularly from, um, from Gold Coast, uh, using Brent's work in relation to intensive care data sets, you know, he's been able to achieve a lot more in very quick time using these cloud-based technologies. And right? so I, I think at the end of the day, and, he's, and, he, and that's in negotiation with Microsoft Azure, I think then, well, we need to look at that. Mm. Yeah. And one from Natalie Smith. I've been looking at the banks who have arguably been ahead of health in digital transformation and the value of data. Do you know if any thought has been put into the structural changes that they have undergone and that might be needed to unleash the value of data and AI apps? And I'm guessing that means in the clinical realm. Mm -hmm. uh, good question. I think, you know, it's amazing, isn't it, how some industries, I mean, AI is, is around us everywhere <laughs> and uh, we don't understand, um, well, we do understand a bit now how, our data has been commercialized for other parties' profits uh, rather than necessarily uh, giving a benefit to us. And, and that's, you know, uh, through the banking system to some extent as well. But I think that, you know, it, it, I think why banking is, is um, such a perfect example is that it's very transactional, okay? And it's context-free. I mean, you know, you don't have to worry about a complicated patient and deriving a lot of information that's very nuanced and peculiar to that person. You know, it's basically, you know, a ledger system, isn't it? And a transactional system, you're just sort of changing money. And it's profit-driven, you know? The banks, I'm sure, have done very well out of AI. It's simplified their, uh, many of their uh, processes and allowed, allowed them to, you know, put off staff, all the rest of it. So it's, it's, it's a definite return on investment very quickly. And I think the, the infrastructure doesn't need a lot of tweaking in the sense that you know they've been digitized now for quite some time and as i said it's a relatively simple context when you come to healthcare it's a lot more complicated okay um and there's also then as i said um a lot more got, um concern around what uh, what errors may be made so i think it's not really a definite um, application everyone thinks and we've had this you know not just with uh, ai but a whole range of things in clinical care people used to think we look at business look how industry and uh, banks and other things do things and we can then just transform that sort of way of thinking uh, uh, that sort of business management into healthcare. well it's come a cropper many times because healthcare is not that simple all right so i think it comes down to the cognitive aspects and when, when developing a model okay to understand 
how does a clinician think about this patient? How do they make decisions? And that's got to be incorporated into the in, in, into the um, into the design. So I think it's more than just infrastructure and technology. Okay, I think that's a given, and we can do that reasonably well. It's that cognitive aspect that's a lot more difficult, and uh, that's where I think the banking analogy doesn't really apply. Okay, great. Thanks, Ian. Um, there are actually other questions there, and uh, I think Jean Jean said, um, please, if you've got questions for Ian, uh, you can contact him um, directly or myself. Um, but first of all, we'd like to thank you very much for your time today. Um, this is actually the end of um, the seminar series, the AI Plus seminars. Um, we've, I guess over the past, uh, this is the third talk, we've brought you three experts in the field, all clinically related. Um, Professor John Fraser introduced us to the amazing international work that's happening with, within ICU units to improve care, um, led right here in Queensland, which was great. And then Professor Peter Sawyer gave us insights into the world of precision prevention for advanced melanoma. So that was a specific AI use case. And today, um, Professor Ian Scott's guided us through the trials and tribulations of translating AI into healthcare organisations. And as I think we've all learned today, it's certainly not an easy journey. Um, so today we conclude the series and I hope everyone's had the opportunity to learn about AI in healthcare, make some new contacts and even identified potential areas of new collaboration and research, which is really the purpose of the series. Um, and also a big thank you to Sue Bezu and Jan 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 for organising these events. Thank you very much, everybody. And thanks again, Ian. Thank you, Andrew.